This is CBC Here and Now. Why are our roads so brutal? Is it environmental conditions? Is it the cross stall conditions? Is it the fact that, you know, we have the highest use of studded tires in the country? Pavement testing is underway to find out. You don't know what you're gonna get when you swipe right with Tinder. How new technology is spreading an old disease. Other than a date, you may come away with something you didn't want. Heading offshore to fish cod. Cod, uh, it's such a good fish, it should be fetching a better price. But it's selling for half of what it did before the moratorium. Another widespread record-breaking day today. Maybe a few more records tomorrow, but we're certainly trending down temperature-wise as we roll into the weekend. The details are coming up. Let's get to our top story. Ruts in the road, potholes, crumbling shoulders, take your pick. Regardless of where you drive in this province, you'll find people who will complain about the condition of our highways. Definitely, it's an ongoing problem, but one the government is trying to solve with a pilot project and a six and a half kilometer long stretch of fresh asphalt outside, asphalt rather, outside St. John's may hold the answer. Here now is Fred Hutton picks up the story. If you've driven west on the Trans-Canada Highway between the Manuals Access Road and Soldiers Pond this week, you've probably noticed nice brand new pavement making for a smooth ride. But this is often what motorists have to navigate, ruts that are at the best of times hard to avoid, and when the weather is bad, it's dangerous. But yeah, it's common I, in myself, you know, if I'm driving in the rain, lots of times I'll do my best to avoid the rutting. With that in mind, Transportation and Works has put down five kilometers of test strip pavement on the highway. The crews used three different formulas to see which one holds up best. One thing this project could allow us to do is we'll have comparisons of, of pavement in, in pretty much a close proximity to see how, how it's wearing. And, you know, is it environmental conditions? Is it the frost stall conditions? Is it the fact that, you know, we have the highest use of studded tires in the country in this province? An important part of this process includes ongoing testing of the pavement that's put down on roads in Newfoundland and Labrador. That takes place here at this mobile field lab in Donovan's Industrial Park. Samples of the pavement are already being tested at this mobile lab. We got we to gotta test it hot, so we test it at 150 degrees. Part of that testing includes hammering the sample 75 times on each side and then putting it in this machine to see if the asphalt can stand up to extreme pressure before it bends or crumbles. Constantine says so far things are going well, but the full results won't be known until the spring. In the meantime, there'll be anecdotal feedback from drivers. And of course, motorists will let you know too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll let you know anyway, but no matter how good it is, they'll let us know. For Here and Now, Fred Hutton, CBC News, St. John's. We've heard it before, government needs to cut taxes and slash spending. Well, today that pitch came from the province's Employers Council with backing from the Conference Board of Canada. And as Here and Now's Terry Roberts reports, the ideas are radical. The Liberals call their plan the way forward. Well, the Employers' Council calls theirs another way forward. Government's public plan does nothing to appreciably lower spending over the next four years. How do we accomplish that? Another way forward calls for the immediate elimination of the deficit reduction levy and the gas tax surcharge. Plus reduction or the outright elimination of other taxes, including payroll tax. Cost to government, $600 million. A big hit to the Treasury, but is it realistic? Yes, yes they could, if they fix their spending problem. When it comes to health and education, we can't afford the system we have now. Right? So what do we do? Do we wait for five years for the demographics to get even worse and, and the whole system falls apart? We can't afford to do that. One of the largest public sector workforces in Canada, billions in health spending, the highest ratio of teachers to students in the country, Alexander says it's not an attack on the Liberals, the public service, or even rural areas. But Dwight Ball says it would sink the province. If we were to implement uh, the Employers' Council report today, it would mean thousands of cuts in health care services, cuts in education, and so on. We've laid out our seven-year plan, and so that's we will be sticking with that. 
Ball called the report a paper exercise, rather than the balanced approach his government will follow to return the province to financial stability. Richard Alexander questions whether the province can wait that long. The issues that we have in this province now, it's beyond politics. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. So some pretty serious claims there. Debbie, you'll be talking to Richard Alexander later in the show. You did an interview with that's, him, right? That's right. Coming up uh, in a little bit, as okay. they say. <laughs> Another gorgeous day. Uh, I was actually, I walked to work and I actually had to change my shirt by the time I got here. Yeah, and yeah. I wasn't expecting it. Fabulous. That. I almost didn't come back for my interview. <laughs> <laughs> I almost didn't come back from lunch. Uh, Anthony Germain almost did the weather tonight. Uh, oh, you don't ever want that to happen. I don't know how you do what you do. Uh, well, today, truth be told, uh, temperature bust in San St. John's. The winds expected to be a little bit stronger from the southeast. They were lighter, and so we really heated up nicely. Uh, it, you always want to see the temperature bust this way, where the high expected around YYT to be 12 degrees ended up near 18. I was thinking we'd get warm inland for parts of the Avalon, but even closer to the coast, it got pretty warm today thanks to those lighter winds. Now, uh, these temperatures that are in orange. These are all the weather stations that set records today. Now, some of these, like yesterday, are more impressive than others. Record since 86 at McCovic. McCovic was the hot spot today, 22.7 degrees. Not too often can you say that. Record since 65 in Deer Lake, 40s uh, for Goose Bay, Daniels Harbor, Stephenville, and Hopedale. Those were all record breakers today, so very, very impressive. Uh, tomorrow, not so much across the southeast. We will get back into the teens for central western Newfoundland. Once again, watch for those fog patches to start the day. Some patchy drizzle for Metro, uh, the Avalon, the Buren, the south coast, and that rain in Lab West. And we'll talk more about Friday and, of course, your weekend forecast in full detail in just a few minutes. Anthony? Thanks, Ryan. There's a real drug problem in St. John's, and it will take the entire community to solve it. RNC Chief Joe Bolin sent that message out and made it loud and clear at a town hall meeting last night. Boland spoke at Waterford Valley High School in the west end of the city. The public meeting was set up by area MHA Siobhan Cody. Health Minister John Hagee was also there. And they agreed that similar town halls should be held at other high schools and more government and community involvement is required to find solutions. Boland, who's been a police officer for 35 years, says he's surprised at the extent of the problem. Look, to be honest with you, I didn't think I'd ever see some of the things that we're seeing now with needle use and, and the addictions and what's, you know, first of all, we got these issues with drugs and then what are the addictions doing to drive, you know, home evasions, armed robberies, uh, those types of crimes, even violence in our homes. So it is an issue and uh, we want to work with community. You know, the policing is only one part of trying to make this community safe and well. Cabinet ministers don't get the best parking spots by the west entrance to Confederation Building anymore. Now, the ones closest to the door must be reserved for people needing blue zone parking. But you can still see vestiges of the old signs reserving those spaces for cabinet ministers. It turns out that for years the government was in violation of its own accessibility regulations. The work cost less than $7,000. Police on the northeast coast want to know who killed this dog. Bella was a five-year-old boxer who got off her leash in Summerford on Monday morning. Then she was shot by a pelican. She died yesterday. Her owner can't fathom why someone from her small community would target her pet. Like she was old or sick or her lifespan was up or some kind of thing like that. Someone intentionally killed her. She had years and years left to live and left to be with us and left to make memories and someone took that from us. It's the same thing as someone murdering somebody else. It is the same to me. Bella was a part of our lives. Ray Newman is back in court again, this time for allegedly assaulting a woman. In 2012, Newman was acquitted of charges of second-degree murder in the death of his estranged wife, Chrissy Predham Newman. Today, her uncle Bruce Harvey rallied to remind the public and the court about his niece and the violence perpetrated against women and girls. Here now's Carolyn Stokes was there. A rally to protest violence against women held here at Angel's Corner, a memorial to victims of violence. Victims like Chrissy Predham Newman, who is top of mind here today as this group gets ready to march to provincial court, where the man who was accused and acquitted of her murder is facing a new charge of assault against a woman. There's men in this province 
that go in their house, lock their door, haul down their blinds, and beat the out of their wives and children. Bruce Harvey wants to keep alive the memory of his niece and other victims of violence through rallies like this one. No more silence! He led the march to provincial court, not knowing if Ray Newman would be there. Newman is accused of choking, strangling or suffocating a woman in paradise last month. Newman was a no-show, which was no surprise to Harvey, but today wasn't about confronting Newman. Where is the outcry? Where is the justice? It's about sending a message to the public and to government. We want the Andrew Parsons of the world to know that the women's groups in this province want a task force. They've asked for a task force, they got a committee. They want a task force, they want money, they want teeth put into this issue. Newman's case is back in court next month. He may not be there, but Harvey says he will be, and he won't be alone. And I'm going to keep talking till someone listens. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. The St. John's Edge has added another person to its roster, and he's a local basketball player. Noel Moffat grew up in St. John's and dominated on the courts with Memorial University's Seahawks. Uh, the Windsor Express in the National Basketball League drafted the 24-year-old, and he's been playing with the team and living in Ontario for the past year. Moffat says he's excited to return home to play pro basketball at mile one. New technology is making it harder to stamp out an old disease. In this province, there's been a spike in the number of cases of syphilis. And thanks to hookup apps, stopping the spread is a challenge. Here now is Peter Cowan is on that story tonight, and he's joining us live. Peter? Well, Debbie, syphilis rates are on the rise. These confidential government briefing notes lay out a growing number of cases for a disease that had almost disappeared. So far this year, there have been 29 cases, a jump of almost 50 percent. Before 2014, there were only four or five cases a year. The problem, people aren't using condoms as much as they used to. HIV became a treatable disease. People are not so concerned about protection and they are not concerned about acquiring STIs because there is treatment available. So we see increasing syphilis. Technology is contributing to the outbreak as well. It's easier for people to meet and have sex thanks to apps like Tinder or Grindr. And a lot of it is happening anonymously. It's always happened through people meeting in bars, but online hookups often happen without exchanging any personal information. At this clinic in St. John's, that presents a problem for people who come in and get tested. So if, let's say, if it were that you did have an STI, then it's very hard for you to go back and figure out, oh, like, who was that? Do I have their number? Like, do I even have their last name? 92% of the people getting syphilis are men having sex with men. Public health is required to trace the contacts of anyone infected with a sexually transmitted disease. Each person with syphilis has an average of 10 contacts, but most of those are anonymous. An average of only two can actually be traced. If the, the patient cannot tell you exactly the name of the person, contact information, for us it's not possible to trace down and to offer testing and treatment. The health minister says how people hook up has changed, but they still need to understand the risks. You don't know what you're going to get when you swipe right with Tinder. Uh, other than a date, you may come away with something you didn't want. Well, the health minister says the best protection for people having anonymous sex is the simple condom. And he says if you're not using them, you should go to your doctor regularly to get tested. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Peter Cowan. People who, have, who live with disabilities every day still have a right to their sexuality. Why are sex workers backing that statement? We'll have the answer coming up.
When it comes to living with a disability, we've been talking a lot this week about physical barriers, but what about the emotional ones? It can be lonely and isolating with limited places to go to meet people. Here are some of the people with disabilities that we've featured this week with their thoughts about romance and dating. There's not a, a whole lot of places to go. Like most bars in St. John's, uh, for instance, if you want to meet someone that way, aren't accessible. So these social settings, um, a lot of times are off limits for us. Dating online, I think, if you have a visible disability, can be quite tricky because you may be prey to people who want to exploit or take advantage of you. So it's, it's, it's a very different kind of conundrum, I think, for a person with a, a particularly a visible disability because you don't get the choice of whether or not to disclose. It's just, it's right there. Well, at first when I had, when I had my stroke, the gentleman I was with left me because he couldn't have the situation, he left me for a stroke. So I, I dealt with it after a while. It was a bit difficult for it, but I got through it. There's that intimidation factor. They don't know what to expect. They don't know, and I think most often it's that they don't know how to behave. You know, they're, they think they have to behave differently, and, and you don't. You behave the same. We're, we're people. See, we're just people with, you know, different body shapes or sizes or, you know, that type of thing. And as I got older, I found that I tended to be more pickier anyway. So, you know, I sort of put myself in the position where I was the one making the choices. So it only affected me if I let it affect me. One of the stories that my partner and I love to tell is I wouldn't have met her had I not gone to a camp for youth with disabilities that a friend of hers was working at. Like it was, it was actually the, the disability that drew us closer together or put us in each other's path at all. I don't think society in general views persons with disabilities as having sexual feelings. Now, some, some people don't. Some people in the world at large don't have sexual feelings. And I don't think people realize that it's, it's the same for persons with disabilities. We can have messy breakups, just like able-bodied people can. I think there's a tendency to infantilize the person with a disability, to make them a child always, regardless of what their um, cognitive capacity may be. And there's people sort of canonize the other partner if the other partner is not disabled. They're like, oh, well, it's so great that you stay with this person. I know in my relationship, I'm just, I'm just part of the equation. And yes, my partner does some caregiving tasks for me, but I do some for her as well. And that really shocks people, both that I have a partner at all or that my partner is not disabled. Dating and romantic relationships can be a challenge. There is the stigma that people with disabilities aren't mate material. But sex workers are advocating for new attitudes. A word of warning, this next story features some mature content. Here and as Ramona Deering reports. I feel good about it, actually. We're calling her Susie, a sex worker. She's had a handful of clients with disabilities. I think a lot of them do it for practice, so they know what to do or how to have sex for when they do want to get intimate with someone they care about. They know what to do then. They know what kind of stuff will make them tired, what their limits are, that kind of stuff. Those clients wind up feeling encouraged instead of judged. I think it makes them feel a lot better about themselves. And they've thanked me afterwards just for accepting them and letting them be my client because a lot of them do get turned down or they're embarrassed about it. And just to be accepting and, and willing to try stuff with them, they're really thankful for it. It's not uncommon for other sex workers to refuse those clients, mainly for fear of inadvertently hurting them. Plus, accessibility is a huge issue. Susie remembers helping one man who uses a wheelchair to get up some stairs. She put him over her shoulder while he held on to the railing. He was really embarrassed about it. I kind of felt bad for him, just because he was so embarrassed about it and didn't want anybody to know about it. I told him it was okay. He just cried. I cried. It was just emotional for him to go through that. 
people who have who live with disabilities every day still have a right to their sexuality. Heather Jarvis of the Safe Harbor Outreach Project is in constant contact with sex workers. One of the things they've told her is that if they have a client who is deaf, they'll text back and forth to communicate. Sex workers are able to have more honest conversations with clients about what they need and what they're looking for. And when it comes to people with disabilities, what we're hearing again and again from the sex workers in our city is that people with disabilities are feeling really lonely and alienated as though their sexuality doesn't get to exist. Susie says that's the wrong kind of thinking. They're just like anybody else. I mean, a lot of them weren't born with their disabilities. Something's happened and it's made them that way. They're normal people too, it's just average people. The only difference is they have extra struggles. Like having to go over stairs is a struggle for them versus the regular person without a disability who doesn't even have to think about that stuff. But Jarvis says many sex workers do have to think about that. They're living with disabilities themselves, such as chronic pain, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, and hearing loss. Often when we know that disability also plays a huge role in people not being able to find adequate employment, people do what they need to do to make ends meet, to make an income, to keep themselves going. So when sex work is an area where women can make more than men in almost the only job industry, um, a lot of sex workers with disabilities do find sex work a place to get employment that can be with their schedule, meeting their body's needs. Susie says that's not why she's in the business, but working with clients with disabilities is important to her. I know it's hard to find someone to be comfortable with in that way, especially with a disability. I mean, it takes a lot of guts to actually go out and do things like that, especially if you do have a disability. Having to go out and do that and show your face. Ramona Deering, CBC News, St. John's. A day on the bay. Up next, we go aboard a longliner to see what fishermen are hauling in these days.
Meet Helene Abraham and her family and several other families that have come to Gander, a place that has welcomed them with open arms. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. And welcome back for the weather. People are still relishing the mm -hmm. warmth that we've had. Can't believe what you told us about the temperatures in Labrador. Yeah, 22.7 in Makovic today, the hot spot in the province. <laughs> wow. Not too often can we say Makovic is the hot spot. Yeah. Uh, now, not only are us humans enjoying the warmer temperatures, apparently the black flies are b back out and buzzing around and Bit early. biting. Really? Yeah. So. Oh. Keep that in mind if you're heading to central Newfoundland. Uh, now this weekend we will see a bit of a cool down, but I love this picture uh, because uh, there are so many uh, folks that are, of course, getting out on the water. This was Nina Rumble Pie that snapped this uh, just off of Mary's Harbor. They were on their way to their cabin today. Oh, <laughs> These are gorgeous sunbeams. Beautiful, beautiful. And she said the best part about being on the water, no black no flies. flies. That's true. Because <laughs> you never want to deal with those late October black flies. Uh, they're like bears, right? Going into hibernation, really trying to uh, uh, make sure they get their last feed on your neck. Uh, we, would talk, we were talking yesterday about uh, the warm temperatures down in the south. Once again, temperatures comparable to Florida today here across Newfoundland. Current temperatures, it's still 19 in Corner Brook, 19 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Makovic. We have seen a cool down, uh, cool down there at 11 degrees. It's just 12 in St. John's. And a bit more of that southerly flow that we were expecting for much of the day has now moved in. Just a, a, a five or 10 kilometer per hour increase in those winds makes a huge difference as we saw today across the Avalon and we will see those winds a little more dominant across the southeast tomorrow. Really strong winds up across the Maritimes with this next system moving in. Those winds will edge towards southwestern Newfoundland tomorrow. We'll see some gusts upwards of 70 kilometers per hour along exposed areas of that west coast tomorrow and in fact for the wreck house area, we have a wind, uh, wind warning in effect where some gusts could approach 100 kilometers per hour through the overnight tonight in through tomorrow. Special weather statements are in effect for Labrador City. Another 20 to 40 millimeters possible tonight through the day tomorrow, but the rainfall warnings well to the south. A little tidbit for you, parts of New Brunswick have seen upwards of 170 millimeters of rain over the past couple of days from this system, which is again continuing to rain itself out over Labrador City over the next 24 hours. It'll edge its way towards Happy Valley Goose Bay again through the day tomorrow. Some cloud cover certainly dominating at times across the island by 7 a.m. Note those gusts in Port of Basque. Fairly light winds for everyone else. Certainly some fog patches on the go. A mild start once again in that 6 to 10 degree range for most. Uh, just 3 degrees in the north with a few showers there. But a double digit start once again in Happy Valley Goose Bay and over uh, parts of Newfoundland. Now, as we roll throughout the day, by 7 p.m., certainly some showers moving into the Port of Basque region, the Port of Port into the afternoon. Corner Brook, I think it's dry through through tomorrow and then showers arriving about this time or maybe maybe even a little bit later. Happy Valley Goose Bay also in an, to an evening risk of seeing some showers and note those winds they're picking up a little bit as we roll into the Friday evening time period. So we push into Saturday those shower chances will move into central parts of Newfoundland but they're very isolated light far from a washout but certainly temperatures cooling off will be one of the main stories for the weekend. East southeasterly winds, I do think they'll be as strong as 10 kilometers per hour tomorrow, so that will hurt temperatures along the coast of the Avalon. Inland areas of the Avalon could still top out around 14 degrees tomorrow. Uh, Clarenville 13 to 14, Gander towards Grand Falls, Windsor temps really start to warm up through the Humber Valley tomorrow. And yeah, a little more in the way of some sunshine too, uh, shielded from that southeasterly wind, which will be increasing, especially for the west. There is that sun cloud mix we talked about over the southeast parts of Labrador and those showers marching into the west. And we'll talk about that all important weekend forecast when we return in just a few minutes. Anthony. All right, thanks, Ryan. When you talk to fishers in the province about cod, most of them will tell you that northern cod are making a comeback. Governments and scientists agree, but how many fish and how fast is this alleged recovery happening? Well, that's a matter of debate. As the commercial fishery wound down this fall, I had a chance to test my sea legs in Triton with Michael Roberts. He invited me aboard his long liner in the wee hours of the morning to discuss the changes that he sees in the cod fishery.
Uh, I've been fishing all my life, uh, 20 plus years now. I like uh, outdoors in a way. I'm the fishing type of person. It's in the blood. And you've been doing this since you were what age? Uh, 20 years old. You do this with your dad? Yeah, I've done it with my dad before me, yeah. They owned a longliner before me, and yeah. Give me a sense of what uh, the past season was like for you. Well, the past season was a very good season for me. Uh, we started off late, later in the season, like uh, June. Uh, we were we were packed in with the pack ice, but once we got going, I mean, uh, the rest of the season was really good. See a lot of cod this year? Yeah, cod was really good. Uh, back the 1st of August, we had a lot of capelin around the grounds and uh, cod was really good. Compared to previous years, what was it like? Uh, I'd, I'd say we've landed more this year than we did uh, previous years, yeah. yeah. So, significant improvement? Oh yes, yeah, definitely. Now, sometimes you hear the fishermen saying that uh, they're seeing more fish than, than DFO says they're out there. Where, where do you stand on that? Uh, I know that uh, there's been improvements in the cod over the years. I mean, it shut down 20 years, it, it got to improve, right? Not, no fish taken in the ocean whatsoever. So, uh, yes, there's a biomass there, and uh, like you say, when the, when the capelin is around, there's more cod around, right, to, to catch. Were you able to catch the fish uh, as often as you wanted to? Oh, yeah, yeah. Once uh, we got going, we didn't lose many weather days. It was an awesome summer on the water. As far as the price of cod goes, well, how does that sit with you? Cod, uh, I mean, uh, back in 92 when the moratorium was on, we got $1.20 a pound for cod. And today it's, it's based on the quality of the cod. Like you might fetch like 60 cents a pound down as low as 20 cents a pound. I mean, it, it should be a dollar a pound, dollar twenty at least. Right? Why, why do you say that? Well, well cod, uh, it's such a good fish. I mean, uh, and, and the quality of the cod, I mean, uh, it should be fetching a better price. I mean, look at your diesel fuel now. Look at the cost of living, right? We've got, that's 20 years uh, with her shut down and, and, and open it up now and charging less for a cod now than back 20 years ago, right? It don't make sense. Now you also fish crab, right? Yes. Now how was that this year? Crab was awesome. We, uh, we landed our uh, quotas in uh, seven days. Yeah, that, that was a record for us. But I thought I thought crab was on the decline, though. No, there's a bright spot in uh, in Green Bay. We uh, we got some good crab uh, uh, stocks here in the bay. They do, just done a survey two weeks ago, and it's shown a good sign of crab. You know, sometimes we think of Newfoundland Labrador as you know this this oil producer. We forget that there's a fishery and uh, people are making a good living. You're making a good living at this? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, uh, both me and my wife we make a good living. We we bought a second enterprise. Right, so we got two enterprises now. Right? What, what's the second one? The second one we bought like uh, crab and cod and, and, and lobster, right, for seventy thousand dollars, and then we we mortgaged that for 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 nine years, and eight sixty a month we paid for it. it. It's a big gamble, right? I mean, but we're one just eight months more, and we got to pay it off. So. <laughs> what's the future of the fishery like in your mind? Uh, I think uh, we gotta we gotta watch what we're doing. Not not increase the cod too much. I'm the younger guy in in the fishery now. Everybody else is up over me, 60, 70 years old. I'm I'm 49. And for our future, I mean, we don't want to catch it all at one time. Just take baby steps, right? Lots to think about yeah, there. Yeah, there is. I was sort of thinking, oh, I remember the feeling of being on the boat for this song. I was going to sort of hang on to you for dear life for a second. But uh, I want to thank Sherry uh, Vivian. She shot that. And uh, Gary Quigley put it together. But no, it was really interesting for me, especially because I'd never actually been that far out. Yeah. Gives and you a sense of, of the work that's yeah. involved in that kind Absolutely. of a career. But also the optimism that we don't often see when we do fishery stories, right? Yeah. So uh, I want to thank Michael. It was, it was a great trip. <laughs> What to do about the province's finances? Billions of dollars in debt and seemingly no way forward despite government's promise to stem the flow of red ink. Is there another way forward? The Employers' Council says yes.
It's sunny skies today, but it is anything but sunny for the province's finances. Government says it has a way forward, but many are critical of their handling of the ever-growing debt. The Employers Council says it has another way forward. And Richard Alexander joins me now. Well, Richard, in this document, Another Way Forward, you are calling for drastic tax cuts and drastic cuts to spending. And I'm just wondering, how can you do this without, how can government do this without wholesale job cuts and a, and a real smack to consumer confidence? Yeah, well, I, I think you have to look at the, the, the entire picture of where our province is. Uh, everybody has said that we have a spending problem, including the Premier. Um, so if you look at that, uh, the, the government's plan in light of the fact that we have a spending problem, uh, in light of the fact that we have the second highest personal tax burden of, of any province in Canada, uh, where are we going to be at the end of government's plan? So our, our concerns with the plan are, are, are one, spending will still be unsustainable. There's no plan to reduce spending by any, any measurable, appreciable um, uh, amount by the end of, the, of their plan. And the second one is uh, we believe that the taxation just went too far. Uh, a lot of people in this province, especially youth, 43% of our youth, have thought about leaving the province as a result of, of high taxes. So we're, all we're asking for is a modification in light of these unforeseen uh, circumstances. Uh, and we believe that that's a, you know, a vision that, that the province wants to have as well. We'll talk about a modification. You're suggesting spending uh, cuts, and one of the ways is wage freezes or even rollbacks in the public service. Now, uh, Jerry Earl of NAEP seems pretty energized by the way negotiations are going since Kathy Bennett stepped out of finance. Do you think government has lost its nerve in these negotiations? You know, from, from our perspective, you know, you have a, a situation where the, the diff most difficult fiscal situation our province has ever faced. Uh, they didn't like, unions didn't like what they were hearing at the negotiation table. There's a change. Now they like what they're hearing at the, at the negotiation table. So what do you read into that? Well, I think every citizen of this province should be very concerned. Um, you know, if government admits that they have a spending problem, we've got the second highest tax burden in the province. They just took $900 million from taxpayers. I, I think that if they're planning on giving wage re raises, uh, to the public sector. I mean, how do you justify that after taking $900 million in, in additional taxes from hardworking Newfoundlanders and Labradorians? Let's talk about other areas you see where you can, uh, uh, government can reduce spending. In health care, you're talking about, you see, $473 million that can come out. What about people who are going to say, well, how can you do that without closing clinics or hospitals and reducing services? How do you do that? Yeah, so what our, what our document, anotherwayforward.ca, outlines is, is we're not asking for a billion dollars of cuts uh, to anything. But uh, what it does say is that our government overspends so much that if they removed a billion dollars of spending, we would still have the most expensive government in Atlantic Canada. So given that fact and given that, that illustration of how much we spend in things like health and education, uh, we believe that that's an indication that, look, if we look hard at it, if we try to solve some of the problems of delivery with our demographics and things like that, uh, like has been proposed by the Newfoundland Labrador Medical Association, uh, that we can overcome those problems. I want to talk about uh, the impact, direct impact on people of what you're suggesting. When you look at your recommendations for uh, getting a handle on education, I can see that you pointed out there's three schools in this province with three students. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of dozen with 25 students only. Are you saying the government should just padlock these schools? No, I, th I think what we're saying, what this, what the, what another way forward .ca is saying is that, look, the way we're delivering education now. Uh, we can't afford just the way we're delivering it now. So government spent a billion dollars more than what they took in last year to do what we're doing now. And we know that the, the you know, enrollments are going to continue to drop, people are going to continue to get older. So what do we do? Do we spend the same as we're doing now, uh, and in four years' time, the problem is worse? And Richard, are you saying that uh, people who are living in these rural areas where they have these small enrollments, that what, it should just move? No, absolutely not. If we want rural Newfoundland to survive, we can't provide government programs and services in the way we do now. We just, we just can't afford that. Uh, so things will collapse, the province will go bankrupt. Uh, that's where we are. Um, billions and billions of dollars of, of extra spending of money that we don't have uh, is not a good strategy. And given what you've seen uh, from this government, has the business community lost confidence in the Ball government? There's been a, uh, this is the most uh, concerned I've ever seen the business community in my, my entire career. Uh, people, people recognize that there's a political reality to, to what they're trying to do. So you're going to give them a, a little bit of slack here? 
Um, I, I, you know, I spoke with the finance minister uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I firmly believe that in their best interest, everybody wants what's in the best interest of this province. Uh, but their, their plan clearly has a couple of uh, problems with it, and we'd like to see them make a modification to it. Richard Alexander, thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. And at the same time, Levy, that you were doing that interview, uh, the Premier met with reporters, and he said that what the Employers Council wants, what you were told, uh, would amount to thousands of cuts in health and education, and the Premier says he's not going to deviate from his plan. Any idea what Richard Alexander thinks about that yeah, from the we, Premier? We did get back to uh, Richard, and uh, that was just a short time ago. He tells us the Employers Council stands by its position. He says the Council is merely looking for reform. We're going to keep an eye on the story, of course. We're all still waiting to see what kind of deal the government reaches with the public service employees. Uh, no doubt, lots more to come. It was once a picturesque neighborhood. Today, there's nothing left. Two California brothers captured these incredible before and after videos of a Santa Rosa neighborhood destroyed by recent wildfires. Yeah, the siblings grew up in the neighborhood. The forest fires of late, the wildfires killed 42 people, destroyed more than 8,000 structures. We'll have more national news next. It's that time of the program. Time to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Brooke English from Ghoul. Brooke is three and recently finished playing her first year of soccer with the Ghoul's Timbits. Brooke also takes gymnastics with Campia and she'll start swimming lessons at the end of this month. Awesome job, Brooke. You're today's young athlete of the day. Anyway. More of this could come. Please, uh, please. Yeah, that's what everybody says. How long till, you know, what's the last straw before we uh, finally drop? We will start to drop tomorrow, right. especially here in the east. Uh, the weekend is looking much cooler than what we've certainly what we've seen in the last couple of days, which is, of course, record-breaking heat. Uh, but not bad. We're around yeah. seasonal. It's just going to feel so much cooler compared to, we have to remember, though, it snowed at the beginning of the week. Yeah. And we're five days till November. So That's true. we have to all put this in perspective before we look at the long range. What here. I do like is you're saying 
light-ish winds, yes. and that always helps. Big difference. Absolutely, that. yeah. No big winds. Uh, again, tomorrow picking up a little bit along the West Coast, but no big winds this weekend, which is good. Uh, everybody asking, okay, we're getting this, so who who's getting the bad end of right. this deal? Because typically there is somebody that's seeing uh, some bad weather when we're seeing the warm-up. I'll direct your attention to northwestern Ontario, two in Kenora right now, and the highways are coated in snow across northwestern Ontario, southeastern Manitoba, and there is the system, and you can see uh, with the radar, snow there across northwestern Ontario, back into the Dakotas, as well as north uh, southeastern parts of Manitoba. And so, yeah, the cold air has to go somewhere, and it is pooling down right now into the interior parts of the continent. It's a big southerly push of air for us, of course, with this record-breaking heat over the last couple of days. And some very wet weather in between, streaming up uh, through New Brunswick and into western parts of Labrador. Special weather statements continue there. Here's how the next few days are going to play out. Area of high pressure that had us uh, under some pretty sunny skies today. We'll move off to the north. I do think there's some sun in the mix tomorrow, but more cloud cover on the go as that high loose, loses its grip on us. Uh, we will see showers on the go for Labrador City into the Happy Valley Goose Bay region and southwestern Newfoundland for the late day tomorrow. It's an afternoon arrival for Port of Basque up to the Port of Port. I think Cornerbrook stays dry until supper time. And same thing through Happy Valley Goose Bay. It's an early evening arrival there. Pretty solid day for most of the island again. Uh, much warmer than where we should be for this time of year. But certainly a cool down in those onshore winds across the Avalon and the Buren. Now note this front. It kind of loses steam as we roll into Saturday. Certainly some shower drizzle chances along it. But it really starts to to lose its uh, yeah, punch as we roll into the Saturday time period. Double digit temps still possible. Cloud cover dominating. And again, these shower and drizzle chances are fairly light, isolated, but are certainly on the go. And as I mentioned uh, with Debbie there a minute ago, and Anthony, it's going to be light winds on the menu. So uh, some good news there, really uh, not half bad. Uh, and again, Labrador clearing out from west to east. As we move into the Sunday time period, another area of high pressure moves overhead. Perhaps a little bit of uh, later clearing for the northeast coast down through St. John's. Wouldn't be surprised if the cloud cover dominates for a good portion of the day, but it does look like we'll see some afternoon clearing there uh, with those onshore northerly winds. Again, temperatures likely topping out in the high single digits. We're into the low double digits for inland areas and across into southern Labrador with more showers on the go for Labrador City. A look into that long range shows, shows the area of high pressure moving off to the east. This will allow our next system to move in Monday into Tuesday, which is of course Halloween. The timing of this rain that'll move west to east across the island will obviously be key, but it does look like a pretty good chance of some snow on the go for you folks in western Labrador. Halloween night and in through the Wednesday morning time period. And so showers, yes, but far from a washout on Wednesday. And we'll, of course, keep uh, Tuesday, that is Halloween day. And we'll keep you posted on that over the next couple of days into Labrador. Again, uh, Halloween mixing with snow in through western parts of Labrador with a big cool down for Wednesday. In national and international news tonight, a survey of Canadian pediatricians suggests more parents of terminally ill children have been inquiring about medically assisted death. And the lead investigator of the survey says mature minors are asking their own questions too. It was partly about having control for their own lives and partly uh, about fear of pain and suffering as an example. Um, but, you know, I think their reasons would be as varied as the adults that also uh, seek assistance in dying. In the past year, 35 pediatricians said they had exploratory discussions with patients under 18 years old. Nine doctors say they received explicit requests for assisted death from minors. Details of the settlement that came with an apology to three Canadian men who were tortured and wrongly accused of terrorism are now out. Abdullah Al-Malki, Ahmed Al-Maati and Moyed Nouradin will split more than $31 million. All three were separately detained in Syria, started in 2001. Each filed a $100 million lawsuit against the Canadian government a decade ago. Their cases were put on hold ahead of a federal inquiry. It found the actions of Canadian officials that included CSIS, the RCMP, and Foreign Affairs. They were indirectly responsible for the torture of the three men. Ottawa apologized in March, saying a settlement had been reached. But the federal government released no information until now. 
One of the first women to go public with allegations against Harvey Weinstein is Ashley Judd. And now she's given details to ABC's Good Morning America. She says it happened during a scheduled business meeting in a hotel room about 20 years ago. The movie producer refused to take no for an answer. Finally, I just said, when I win an Oscar in one of your movies, okay? And he was like, yeah, when you get nominated. I said, no, when I win an Oscar. And then I just fled. And then I just fled. Judd says a few years later, she was seated opposite a Weinstein at a dinner table. He brought up the subject of what he called their little agreement and then said he was not going to let her out of it. Our viewer picture of the day, and I'm giving you a big clue if you happen to know where Cobb's Pond is. If you don't, somewhere in Central, uh, guess the town. I'll let you know after the break. Back once again, a rare sight has been captured on camera in Point Lanim, New Brunswick. This is a silver fox. It was spotted in the yard of a cottage, and the man who took the photo says this elusive, beautiful critter stopped him in his tracks. It but is luckily, beautiful. It not is. enough to stop him. <laughs> yeah, we're so happy that he managed to capture those photos. Now, staying with the animal kingdom, a little <laughs> bit of a laugh for you now. You can just call him the Moose Whisperer. So a moose near my place. And uh, <laughs> look at him. looks like the mooses around here are pretty friendly. Yeah, hunting season in New Brunswick has been over for a couple of weeks, so this moose was game for a selfie. <laughs> yeah, the experts aren't sure why this creature is so docile, but watch what happens here. Uh, they do avoid you not to get <gasps> this close. <laughs> oh, my. And that's close. Don't get that close to a wild animal, even though you can see it's pretty tempting. <laughs> I wonder if he talked to the guy that got uh, run over by the moose here a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty risky there. Unbelievable. But he like is a big dog. He is the moose whisperer. <laughs> That's true. That's right. He yeah. is the moose whisperer. You don't try that. I wonder that. if not having any eye contact sort of made it possible as he was sort of... Uh, didn't scare the moose. Let's try it. Let's head <laughs> out. You first. Okay. You first, Me Brian. first. Yeah, junior guy. All right, have a look at uh, beautiful oh, picture we lovely. talked about. Cobb's Pond. Any guesses? 
I'm just enamored with a kayak. Yeah. Wow. I yeah. know the name. I know I should Cobb know Pond, it. Cobb Pond. Gary Locke, who is our switcher director tonight, guess correctly, Gander. Uh -huh. And oh. again, it's on the northwest. Uh, just watch where the picture flies out of there. Is the pond and a beautiful picture there from Lori Ann Wiseman. You there know, I was asking you about the winds and hoping it would be calm. I'm hoping to do that on the weekend. Very nice. Yeah, and that really encourages me even more. Even better. <laughs> That's our program for tonight. Uh, thanks for being with us. Have a great night and see you tomorrow. See ya. Good night.